All right. If you'll look with me, I want you to turn in your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 17. 2 Kings. We're going to continue some of our thoughts on Assyria today, and we'll tie it in with the rest of the book. If anybody needs one of these sheets, Jarrett's got them. He'll be responsible for passing those out. All right. So I want to write this on the board just so I can see it. Yeah, 2 Kings 17. 2 Kings 17. All right, Assyrian kings. Tiglath. Pelezer. Don't name your kid that. It's too complicated, okay? Um, 745. The 727. Now remember, we're going backwards here. We're working our way down because we're in B.C. So he reigns. He's pretty popular. tiglath Pileser is the name of the guy who was coming in judgment in like the Isaiah chapter 7 to 10 range. So when you get all those prophecies that are in there that are famous. Is it Isaiah 7 the famous one? Is it Isaiah 7? No, that's 10. The one, the one about the birth of Jesus, the virgin birth. Is it Isaiah 7? Isaiah 7. Yeah, okay, yeah. Tiglath Pileser is the one that's involved in that. The next one's name is Shalmaneser. S H A L M A N E S E R. Shalmaneser reigned from 727 to 722. Now, I want to read here in 2 Kings chapter 17 because Shalmaneser is the one that is in charge of Assyria whenever Assyria comes and takes Israel, the northern tribe. So. Somebody read for us in 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 to 6. Jarrett, I nominate you as tribute. In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosh Hoshea, the son of Elok, became king of Israel. All right, make a, make a mental note here. Ahaz, not real good, okay? Not real good. Keep going. And he reigned nine years, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmanazar, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hoshea became his vassal and paid him tribute. Yeah, vassal. So he's just paying homage to him. Why, is, why would he pay homage to in taxes and tribute to Assyria? Why would he do that? Because he's scared, right? They, they're gonna, they can conquer him. So, all right, we'll, we'll, here's a treaty. We'll, we'll be your vassal state. You're in charge of us. Now, this is a good important note. Israel on, of it, on its own was a theocracy, meaning that God was their king, God was in charge. Were they supposed to be scared of anybody else, yes or no? The answer is no. But what, essentially what they do, they become vassal states, vassal states of Babylon, vassal states in the New Testament to who? Rome. Rome, because Rome's in charge, They have and they're setting up everything that's going on in Judah. All right, does that make sense? Jared, keep me on. Uh, and the king of Assyria uncovered a... Conspiracy by Hoshea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria as he had done year by year. Therefore, the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Now, the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. In the ninth year of Hoshea, the king of Assyria took Sam Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Halah by the Har by the Habor, the river of Gozan. And in the cities of the Medes. Okay, so we know Shalmaneser, he's the one that winds up coming to take Israel. When it says Samaria, that's another reference to Israel, okay? Israel, Samaria, and they get taken during this time of 721 B.C. Everybody with me there? We good? Well, interesting note. Shalmaneser dies in the battle, Okay. Some way or another, this cat dies in this siege. So that's just important to know. All right, back to our notes. Does anybody need the notes that's walked in? Does anybody need notes? Jarrett, we got three that need notes right in the back there if you don't care. Um, next king, Sargon II, 722 to 705. Notice we're working our way down. So does Israel exist at this point when Sargon takes over? Yes or no? Israel, speaking of the ten northern tribes, in 722 to 705. Okay, so they're right on the heels here of this judgment. Some people think it's 720, 721, 722. There, he comes and judges Israel, carries the northern tribes off. They're out of covenant. That's what Hosea predicted. Everybody got it? We spent a whole year on that, it feels like. Sargon II takes over, 722 to 705. Now, 
what we're doing essentially is working our way from Assyria down to Babylon. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, all right, how do I get to 586 B.C.? Because 586 B.C. is when the Babylonians are in charge and they judge Judah the south. Everybody go with that. Okay. The history helps. I know it's kind of boring, but it really does help. Okay. The next king, from 705 to 681, his name is Sennacherib. And this is a famous conflict. And I want us to go to, um, not W Kings, but I think that's, that's either first or second Kings. I don't remember. I think it's second. Go to second Kings with me. Let's go to second Kings chapter 18. Second Kings 18. Sennacherib, or if you're feeling real spiritual, you can call him Sennacherib. Sennacherib reigns 705 to 681. Is it 2 Kings I'm looking for or first? Alright, let's do it. We're going to read pretty much all of 18 and 19, so buckle down. We need to know this. Now listen, Hezekiah is not the king of Israel. Why is he not the king of Israel? Because Israel doesn't what at this time? It doesn't exist. It's been taken already. He's the king of Judah, the south. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right, good king, in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke sacred pillars. He cut down wooden image and broke pieces of bronze, serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Neheshtan, false god. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. The Lord was with him. He prospered wherever he went. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He wasn't scared. He subdued Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. Now it came to pass in the fourth year of King Hezekiah, which was the seventh year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against Samaria and besieged it. And at the end of three years they took it, in the sixth year of Hezekiah, that is, the ninth year of Hosea, king of Israel, Samaria was taken. So the north's done. Then the king of Assyria carried Israel away captive to Assyria and put them in Halah and by the Habor, the river of Gozan, and the cities of the Medes. Now notice this too. Just because the Medes and the Persians and Babylon are not dominating the whole world power scene yet, that doesn't mean that they're not already on the scene. Okay? So their kingdoms and empires are being built, what I would say, is behind the scenes. Alright, verse 12. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed His covenant, that's exactly what Hosea said, and all that Moses the servant of the Lord commanded, and they would neither hear nor do them. And in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Then Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, I have done wrong. Now notice how Hezekiah was, I'm not bound to this guy. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to trust in the Lord. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Well, this king, he decides that he's going to come back. Remember, the north Israel and Samaria, they're already wiped away. But now the king decides... He's going to come back and he's going to start working on Judah. He's going to work on the land in the south and he's going to try to take them. Well, Hezekiah gets cold feet after a, a place that was north of them called Lachish gets taken by Sennacherib and the Assyrians. So when Hezekiah hears about that, he's like, eh, I might have changed my tone here. So verse 14 says, Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria at Lachish, saying, uh, I've done wrong. Turn away from me. Whatever you impose on me, I will pay. Huh. Is he supposed to do that, yes or no? No. And the king of Assyria assessed Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. That's what he had to pay. 
So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found where? In the house of the Lord and the treasuries of the king's house. Not good. At that time, Hezekiah stripped the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. Now remember, we're late 700s here. We're in, around the 705 to 681 range. Somebody begin reading for us in 17 and just keep going. I know this is burdensome, but we need to read it. That's just like the, uh, ch he's like the chief officer of their army. Well, that's why I passed it off, passed it off to you. I might be from Harrisburg, but I'm not a moron. Essentially, what this, the right-hand man of the Assyrian king is telling is like, look, are y'all really going to trust your God? After all, we've already torn down all their altars. You've heard what was done in the north in Samaria. Is Judah really going to think that they can overcome us? Keep going. Now let's, let's note this here. You've got the Assyrian messengers, the right-hand man and, the, and those who were sent by the king of Assyria telling the people of Judah saying, listen, Hezekiah is going to tell you that Yahweh can save you, but he can't save you. Y'all might as well just submit and come to us or what happened to Israel in the north is going to happen to you in the south. Everybody got it? He was telling them in Hebrew and they said to him in Aramaic and I'll be honest, I don't know why because I know you're going to ask me. I'm a failure. I've let you down. Uh, sorry. Were you going to ask me that? What? Were you going to ask me why he changed the language? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Thank you. That's a sign of a lady right there that loves her pastor. She's not going to ask him questions that she knows he doesn't know. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Karen. Yeah, please. Sound familiar? Oh, we're going to take you to a new Eden. No, you're not. That you may live and not die. But, but do not listen to Hezekiah, lest he persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations at all delivered its land? 
Ben from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of, of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Jafar Balaam and Tina and Iba? Indeed, have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among all the gods of the land have delivered their country from my hand? That the Lord should deliver Jerusalem from my hand. But the people held their peace and answered them not a word. For the king's commandment was, do not answer him. Then Eliakim, the son of Ataiah, who was over the household, Shebna and the shot, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the reporter, came to Hezekiah with their clothes torn and told him the words of the... I guarantee you they were scared to death. I mean, you're, you've seen everything they've done. They're terrorizing people all over the place. They've already taken the ten northern tribes. You're, you're Hezekiah. You know the people have been in sin for all this time. You're trying to bring a reformation to get them back worshiping the temple, and now they're coming saying they're coming against you. I hate to do this to y'all, but you, we're going to have to read chapter 19 too. Is that okay? We good? All right. Jordan said he'd read Jordan did. Okay. I'll read 19. And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it, does anybody care if I read fast? That he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna, the scribe and the elders and the priests, and covered sackcloth to Isaiah, he's a contemporary of all this going on, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This, is, this day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Now, let me point out what this is. That's blasphemy to degrade and defame Yahweh and declare how small and little he is that they could overcome him. Therefore, lift up your prayer for the remnant, Harvey, that is left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Isaiah said to them, Thus you shall say to your master, Thus says the Lord, Don't be afraid of the words which you've heard, which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Surely I will send a spirit upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. You don't trash talk a living God and get away with it. My God calls the shots. Then the Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna. He heard that he had departed from Lachish. And the king heard concerning Taraka, king of Ethiopia, Look how he's come out to make war with you. So he said again, he sent his messengers to Hezekiah, saying, Thus you shall speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Do not let your God, in whom you trust, deceive you, saying, Jerusalem shall be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Look, you have heard what the king of Assyria have done to all the lands by utterly destroying them, and you shall, and you shall be delivered. Have the gods of the nations delivered those whom my fathers destroyed and goes in Haran Respa with his people Eden who were in Telassar? Where is the king of Hamath, the king of Arpad, and the king of the city of Sephravim, Hena, and Iva? They've all been destroyed. Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Then Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations in their land. They've cast their gods into the fire, and they were not gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord, God, I pray, save us from his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. I want to make this note here. James tells us that the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. Friend, when you pray in line with the will of God according to his word, Friends, when you're walking with the Lord, you shouldn't have any doubt that if you pray according to His will, that it'll be answered. And here God comes and He answers it. Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel. Now, friend, tell me, what could a prophet never be? Wrong. wrong. If a prophet's wrong, what happens? Stone. You stone him. Because you have prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word which the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised you, laughed you to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head behind your back. Whom have you reproached and blasphemed? Against whom 
have you raised your voice and lifted up your eyes on high against the Holy One of Israel. Now this is what Isaiah is telling the people of, of Judah that God is saying about Sennacherib in Assyria. By your messengers, Assyria, you have reproached the Lord and said, By the multitude of my chariots I have come up to the height of the mountains, to the limits of Lebanon. I will cut down its tall cedars and its choice cypress trees. I will enter the extremity of her borders to its fruitful forest. I have dug and drunk strange water, and with the soles of my feet I have dried up all the brooks of defense. Did you not hear long ago how I made it from ancient times that I formed it? Now I have brought it to pass that you should be for crushing fortified cities into ruins and heaps. God's saying, look, I'm the one who's got you doing all this, not of yourself. Therefore their inhabitants had little power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as grass of the field and the green herb as the grass on the housetops and grain blighted before it's, grown, before it's grown. But I know your dwelling place. You're going out and you're coming in. That should scare them. And your rage against me. Because you rage against me and your tumult, you have come to my ears. Therefore I will put my hook in your nose and my bridle in your lips and I will turn you back by the way which you came. This shall be a sign to you, Assyria. You shall eat this year such as grows of itself and in the second year what springs from the same. Also the third year, sow and reap, plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. And the remnant who have escaped the house of Judah shall again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go a remnant and those who escape from Mount Zion. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city nor shoot an arrow there nor come before it with shield nor build a siege mound against it by the way he came, by the same he shall return, and he shall not come into this city to Judah, says the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out. Uh-oh, here comes the death angel. Remember the Exodus? And killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000. And when the people arose early in the morning, what time did they, when did they recognize it all? Early in the morning. Remember the Exodus? All happened in the morning. There were all the corpses, all dead. Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now, notice where the head of the capital is. Now it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons, Adramelech and Sherazar, struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the land of Ararat. Then Eseradon... Esarhaddon, or Aceradon, if he's sounding like a dinosaur, his son reigned in his place. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> no clue what that is. <laughs> anyway, everybody get the story? All right. Sennacherib's going to come. He's going to take Judah. God's like, no, you're not, smart mouth. And he sends the death angel and he kills him. Well, that causes a problem. So the sons now see, well, that went south for daddy. So they go and they kill their own dad while he's worshiping his false gods. Well, let's go back to our notes here during this time, and we'll kind of trace all this down a little bit more. Okay, a serious look at Sennacherib, 705 to 681, famous conflict with Hezekiah, we just read that. Babylon, Judah, and Egypt all revolt against Assyria and Sennacherib at the same time. Remember in the text in chapter 18 when it said, "Don't go, you guys better not go down to Egypt, we can overtake them. Well, that's why, because they're all coming in together. If you think about this, maybe you're visual, do it this way. All right, here's the Mediterranean Sea, okay? When Paul takes his missionary journeys, like he's all over this area in Asia and all over in here, okay? The island Crete, remember where Titus was? Down in here, all right? Jerusalem's right here. All of this is the land of Assyria. Are you with me? Babylon's down here. Egypt's down here. Just kind of help you for a visual. We good? All right, that helps me. I don't know if it helps you. Those maps in the back really are pretty helpful on some stuff, so don't be afraid to go back and look at them some just to help give yourself a visual picture. Okay, let's keep going. Assyria's relationship with Babylon had been good and the, the Assyrians respected and took care of the Babylonians because they viewed them as kind of a holy people. Now, you're pagan all over the place, but they thought they were something. So, anyway. 
There's a Babylonian ruler named Merodach Baladon who attempted to make nice with Judah in 689. Okay, so you've got this ruler named Merodach who's in Babylon. Merodach Baladon who's in ba Babylon. He tries to make nice down here with Judah. Okay, remember, the northern kingdom of Syria was, uh, Israel was here, but it's been taken by them. Okay, Lachish is, Lachish is probably about right here. So, a while ago, Hezekiah heard that Sennacherib had come all the way down to Lachish and he sent word up to messengers and was like, nah, that ain't going to fly. We got, I'm going to send you tribute. Don't kill us. So anyway, all right. In 689, Sennacherib destroys Babylon. All right, so he just wound up taking them out, but Babylon will come back into play a little bit later. Now, after, look back with me in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 37. It says this, It came to pass as he was worshiping Sennacherib in the temple of Nisroch, his god, that his sons, Adramelech, sounds like a pharmacist, and Sherazar struck him down with the sword. So his own sons killed him. They're trying to usurp the throne, but it sparks a civil war and the people get mad at him. Instead of one of them inheriting the throne, they wind up fleeing to a different land. Everybody good with that? So this is where the next guy, Ezra Haddon, comes in. Then Ezra Haddon, his son, reigned in his place. Let's go back to our notes. Ezra Haddon reigned from 681 to 669. 2 Kings 19.37 mentions him. So he's in the biblical account too. He was a son that killed Sennacherib, which sparked a civil war. I don't know that that's right, actually. It doesn't say that in the text, does it? It's two different sons. Okay, I don't remember if what I studied was saying there was a different name. So you might want to note that. But either way, Ezra Haddon is probably a different son. I think I wrote that wrong, so note it. Okay, during his reign... There's a king in Judah whose name is Manasseh. Manasseh is a bad king, all right? 686 to 642 is when he reigns, and that's a pretty long time, all right? So Manasseh becomes king down here in Judah during the time of Ezra Haddon. Manasseh's pitiful, but he's in the lineage and the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. So you can go read that at a different time, but I'm going to keep going here for the sake. Okay, the next king of Assyria from 669 to 627 is a guy named Ashurbanipal, and he concerns himself largely with Egypt down in the south. Um, sorry, I skipped that a while ago. Not Ezra Haddon, but Ashurbanipal is uh, the one who winds up having this conflict with Manasseh. During his reign, Manasseh, the king, was taken to Assyria due to a rebellion. Let's go read that. Second Chronicles 33. 11 to 13. Y'all stay with me. I know it's boring, but you're going to look up next week and say, man, that was really helpful. I'm glad we did it. 2 Chronicles 33. <laughs> 11 to 13. Reads this way. Now let's start in verse 10. 2 Chronicles 33, 10. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they wouldn't listen. Therefore the Lord brought upon them the captains of the army of the king of Assyria, who took Manasseh with hooks and bound him with bronze fetters and carried him to Babylon. Now when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God, and he humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers, and prayed to him, and he received his entreaty, God granted it to him, heard his supplication, and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom, then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. All right, so you get a little bit of a humbling experience there for Manasseh. But it's during the reign of this Asher Banipal, if that's how you say that. That might, that might really be it. You laugh at me, but I wouldn't be surprised. Asher Banipal, in the year 640, during his reign, there's a prophet that comes on the scene that predicts the downfall of Nineveh and the downfall of Assyria. And his name is Nahum the prophet Nahum in the Old Testament. Let's flip over to the book of Nahum right quick. First one there gets a sucker. He is known as a minor prophet because the book's so small. On page 820, if you've got my wife's pink Bible. Nahum chapter 1. So I won't, I'm not going to read all this. I just want to read the very first verse. It says this. The burden against Nineveh 
the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkoshite. So Nahum's going to give the prediction of the downfall of Assyria. And that's really where our lesson today is going to take us to end with, is the downfall of Assyria. So a guy named Sarkis, or Sarakis, excuse me, look at your notes. Sarakis takes over as king of Assyria in 623 after another civil war. Okay? During that time, Assyria was concerned with the civil war. A native Chaldean named Nabopolazar came in and he retook Babylon and was able to withstand Assyrian <laughs> conflict from 623 to 617. Everybody good? Is everybody asleep yet? Working on it. We need it. Okay. In 612, Nineveh and Assyria falls to the Medes and the Babylonians just as Nahum had predicted. Is that not cool? Alright. So, where that will take us from there, let's kind of work this out this way. I hope everybody had that. It's in your notes if not. Let's work this out this way. Important dates. 722, 720. Assyria takes Israel, the north. Okay? There in that next span to 700, you have the time of Hezekiah where God protects Judah from Assyria. We good? Then you go all the way down, if you want to skip back down in your 600s there to your times of 640, Nahum predicts the end of Assyria. 612, Assyria falls to Babylon and the Medes. Okay, came in together. Now, what that's going to lead to is the dominance and the takeover on the known world of Babylon. Everybody good? With me so far? Is that helpful? Should be super helpful. I pray it is. What's going to happen now is, because you've got the kings covering a long period. Kings and Chronicles in the Bible covers a long period of time. But if you think about it this way, with two major players, what really happens here is, you go from Isaiah, who's the next big prophet that's going to come on the scene when Babylon takes over? Does anybody remember who it is? Jeremiah. It's Jeremiah. Jeremiah comes in and he takes over. So he probably took over like some kind of bulldog that came after him or something. But anyway, that's just me. Anyway, uh, Babylon comes in and takes over. And Jeremiah is going to be the prophet that comes on the scene. Babylon is going to more or less begin the judgment. Okay, God's going to tell Jeremiah. He's going to say, Jeremiah, listen, you're, the people are in sin. We're going to send judgment. Babylon's going to be the one that comes. That's how the book of Jeremiah begins. And then in the year 586, 586, that's when... Judah will get judged by Babylon. And who is the king? Not a trick question. Who is the Babylonian king? He's the most popular one. Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Everybody got that? We good so far? All right, go with me over to... How much time I got? Do you want me to end it or do you want me to go over another 10 minutes? It's your call. I don't care. All right, let's go another 10 minutes. Go over with me to the book of Jeremiah right quick. We'll get into this more next week, but we'll at least whet your appetite. Jeremiah, look with me at chapter 20. I think I want 29. I didn't plan on going this far, but we will since we're here. All right, Jeremiah 29. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel are already taken. Okay, they're, they're gone. They're taken in deportation. They, there was three different deportations. The last one was in 586. But listen to what Jeremiah says here in Jeremiah 29.1. These are the words of the, of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet, who was still in Jerusalem, sent 
from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. This happened after Jeconiah the king. Underline that. Because in Matthew chapter 1, it makes sure to tell you that Jeconiah was the king, the wicked king, whenever they were taken away in captivity into Babylon. That's in there. So, note that. All right. Where am I at? Verse 2. This happened after Jeconiah the king, the queen, the mother of the eunuchs, the princes of Judah, Jerusalem, the craftsmen, and the smiths. Uh, always the smiths. There's a lot of them. Just read a phone book. Had departed to Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elsa, the son of Shaphan, and Gamariah, the son of Hilkiah, and Zedekiah, the king of Judah, sent to Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, saying, Here, all right, here's what the letter said that Jeremiah wrote. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. I want you to make an important mental note here too. We'll read this next week, but Jeremiah tells the people, he's telling them, get out of the city, it's going down. And all of the re religious leaders and the kings in Judah are saying, we ain't got to leave, they can't overcome us. And Jeremiah is saying, they're coming, get out of the city. Sound familiar? Anyway, verse 5. He tells them, when you're carried away, build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruits. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters. Why? So that you may be increased and not diminished. Seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your, diviner, your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreams. For they prophesy falsely to, not, to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after seventy years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return. Where? To this place, back to Jerusalem. Everybody got it? So how long are they going to be in captivity? Seventy years. After that, they return. Now here's what I say good. Here's where this helps us at. What's 586 minus 70? Does that get a sound of what? 516, roughly that range. Now how many years of silence do we have? How many years of silence do we have Old Testament to New Testament? 400. And most people believe Jesus was born either in 1 or in 4 B.C., which I lean toward 4 B.C. So if we've got 400 roughly years of silence, we don't have very many more years to go of history here that we've got to figure out what's going on in the Old Testament because you're going to get 400 years of silence. Does that make sense? But one of the most neglected portions of the whole Bible is what's known as the restoration period. And I'll admit, I'm not that familiar with it either. The restoration period is when they return from Babylon and what do they do when they return? They rebuild the what? The wall, the city, and the temple. The book of Ezra, Nehemiah, Malachi, and Zechariah will be written after that time. So that's kind of where we want to go. And the reason I want to do all this is because I want to walk us down into Malachi. That way we know exactly where we're at when we begin Malachi. Probably not next week, but the week after. Is that good? So I know that's boring in a history lesson. Next week will be far more enjoyable. One of the easiest books, I think, to read, and, and I don't understand everything in it, but one of the easiest books for me is the book of Jeremiah. It's just it's more enjoyable than, and not as difficult as some of the other ones, in my opinion. So we'll spend some time there next week and talk about the Babylonian stuff, and we'll throw in Daniel, and then we'll work our way down to Malachi after the restoration period. Is that good? All right. Hope that was beneficial. Judy wasn't tracking with me today, so I snoozed her. Let's pray. <laughs>